uh, this is the art, agency, and testimony in the work of Chea Stoika panel. And uh, I think this is a very interesting panel. Um, so we're going to have the first presentation uh, uh, from uh, Paul Bernard Nero. And uh, so we agreed not to introduce them properly as we did all along in this conference, but I just thought that he's from the Eco des Arts de la Sorbonne, University Antoine Sorbonne, correct? Yeah. And then uh, we're going to have a, a double presence, yes. like, like a two typical person. People will uh, give a presentation, Laura French mm -hmm. and Karina Kurta from the Pacific University of Oregon and Chia Stoika International Fund. And then uh, we're going to have Stefan Bendig uh, from the House of Austrian History. And um, so I give you the floor, the first one, the first presentation is cool. And uh, the title is Confronting Art to Archives and Testimonies, uh, the case of Chia Stoika's works. And thank you very much, Maria, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy and honored to be here today, and um, a bit stressed to talk about uh, Chaya Stoshka's work today. Uh, I would like to start by recalling that uh, in Europe, Chaya Stoshka's paintings and drawings have been quite widely displayed over the past two decades, with a significant acceleration in the five past years. Just to mention, uh, uh, just mentioned the monograph exhibitions. Her uh, uh, has been exhibited at the Jewish Museum in Vienna in 2004, the Kavan Gallery Pacific University in 2009, the Kunstverein in Berlin in uh, 2014, the Heidelberg Kunstverein in 2015, the Friche de la Belle de Mai in Marseille in 2017, the Maison Rouge in Paris uh, the next year. Uh, the Eight Park of Museum in Ischmengen in uh, 2019, the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid in 2020, the Manuel Constal in the Sintra Museum of Art uh, last year, and this year uh, in Sevilla. Uh, at the same time, this recognition is per se an achievement. The Chaya Sochka's work remain in, remains in between. On the one hand, it has been displayed by artistic institutions, which suggests that she has been fully recognized as an artist. On the other hand, her works have been regarded, regarded mainly as an historic testimony, a regard that therefore partially marginalized uh, them as artworks. Several reasons explains, uh, explain this paradox, and it might be worthy to introduce my lecture with a brief analysis of this reason. They come from two main directions, which are seen as contradictory, not to say antagonist. The historic field, itself marked by a judiciary model we talked about it earlier, and the art history and aesthetic discourse, both in its now outmoded conservatism and its still vigorous modernism. Over the past century, modernist critics proportionated the value of an artwork uh, to its self-referentiality, the ability of the artist to emancipate his creation from any other subject that art, than art itself became the main goal, the goal notably achieved by abstract painters. <clears throat> Nonetheless, the modernist uh, topos remains present in large part of art history discourse in the disguise of a cliché. Paradox, paradoxically, its le legitimacy finds some support in the conservative discourse on art history which that does not care so much about the content of an artwork, but which is more concerned about respecting the hierarchy between low and high art based on the artist's skills and overwhelming talents. The conservative point of view in art history can tolerate, for instance, abstraction, as long as it satisfies classic, if no, not academic, know-how standards. In both cases, Jaya oeuvre is misplaced her work are too obviously referential for modernists and not mastered enough uh, for conservative, which pulled them away from the artistic sphere as well uh, as to aesthetic valuation. 
logically, such a rejection should, should drive them into the arms of the historians. We do not open their arms so easily uh, to images in general and less to images that are seen as providing testimonial content. Uh, the traditionally historiographic approach usually treats this kind of images as document on which to apply an evaluation based, based sometimes on judicial models. In this respect, iconographic documentation should abide to the eyewitness account patterns in which superfluous consideration must not interfere. <coughs> if it does, then historians can dismiss them without affecting the testimonial content embedded in these documents, a dismissal that can even be seen as a necessary mean to preserve the testimonial content. To sum up, in one case, the aesthetic, aesthetically part of an artwork presumably affects in a negative way uh, its propensity to provide a pure testimony. In the other case, its testimonial intention would allegedly prevent it to be considered as a pure work of art. In this context, we all understand that I recall these archetypal positions, not because they are of any help to examine and interpret Chayastoshka's earth, but because they remain suggested to its reception. In a contradictory way, I would like to demonstrate that a close examination of her walls revealed their testimonial potential not against their artistic dimensions, but thanks to them. To substantiate what could be seen as a base position, I need to make a distinction between two levels of testimony visible in Chayastoshka's pictures. The first one would be of historical nature, Many elements represented in her works provide uh, historical evidence that can be fruitfully uh, cross-checked with others' testimony. The second is of memorial nature. Some artistic decisions she made, some forms she used, gives us information about how witnessing temporality thrives through times, how the experience interferes with the witness intimacy, and sometimes obliterate the very idea of time passing, as we heard earlier. This case. I thought with the photograph that everybody may know, the photograph showing Shaya Soshka on the memorial site of the Bergen Belsen concentration camp uh, almost 10 years earlier, clearly sets a will to see her work recognized as a testimonial one, if not as a piece of evidence. But an evidence of what? Of the fact that she has been in Bergen Belsen, so she's a witness of the fact she's standing here 58 years later, so she's a survivor, of the fact she displays a picture she made, so she's an artist. And none of these facts can be entirely one from the other without disregarding the image she produced by displaying her work in those circumstances. While per se, and at first glance, the picture does not appear as a piece of evidence. European eyes can, of course, suspect that this train for being a cattle train has to do with the memory of the Nazi genocide, but it is impossible to assert that the train conducted today is Jews or Romans. or Romans. Otherwise, the only indication that can conflict with the traditional landscape pattern is the white swastika board in the very center of the composition. I talk about European eyes, suggesting that we do share a collective memory, and I don't come back on the two levels uh, Laurel French mentioned, but uh, the frameworks of memory by Maurice Alvax and also the cultural uh, memory by Aleida and Diana Asman uh, about the Stoshka family. But this being said, one might need to be more cautious about the differences in this shared memory. Here, Shaya Stoshka shows the site of Leierberg in Vienna's 10th district. By then, it was a land landfill where many uh, runners were gathered by the Nazi Austrian authorities. The text she wrote on the back of the picture recalls this forgotten episode of the persecution. But this oblivion does not make it does not have to do with the nightmares I mentioned. The text explaining where are the Romanists asks another question. Where the, where are the horses that were taken away from there? My point is that this specific observation will not have been made by non romanic observers, and therefore it confronts us to a, a, our own limitations. But it also teaches us to look differently some, uh, to some archive images, such as photographs from the Berlin Marzen transit camp for Tigerino, the first one to be established on the occasion of the Olympic Games two years, uh, two years prior to Vienna. When we look 
are these photographs informed by Shia's documentary or on, uh, on picture? We understand that the horses are missing, so that these people were forced to sit alone. They cannot travel anymore, and the missing horses are then to be seen as warning signs of the future missing people. In comparison, the painting entitled Fun starts to break the idyllic vision of country life by distancing in the same movement was the lover from the horses and the viewers from the depicted scene. When approaching uh, Auschwitz Birkenau, Jais Doshka replaces uh, the compact rectangle of the Romani caravans by uh, round blocks which look like the crematoriums and a white seed plume of smoke by a huge grey stream that differentiated itself from the thick chimney only with the red and yellow flames at the top of the hill. The representation of the fire emerging from the chimney and the exaggeration of the size of, uh, of it excess in a way the mere witness account, since we know that no flames went out of Gekenau crematorium, which was not that big. It excesses the testimony, but to represent these elements, elements in a monstrous way, it says something about it, and it says something about who is remembering it. Charles Stoczka does not say through her picture, this happened this way. She said that this happened this way in her eyes, and she saw it. And hence, that does not mean that this not happened. In Charles Stoczka's style, the excess is not only due to artistic reasons, it belongs entirely to the testimony itself. But the way the excess results from a series uh, uh, results from a series not only of distortions but, for, but of metamorphoses. It is artistically motivated and sometimes culturally energized. The black birds, for instance, can be identified with crows, which are assimilated with bad omen in many European cultures. In Chaya's pictures, the goals of crows regularly become bothered wild reviving one of the most common visual tapos of the Nazi can, uh, can, the depiction. Now less common about amongst the Barbers' memoirs are the boots of the prominence and capos and the SS guards. In uh, her own memoir, Chaya Soshka mentions no less than five times the boots, always presented as, as shiny. The first time she mentions them, she writes, I quote, the SS were tall and thin, I could only see their other Polish posts. This painting, made 18 years after her written account, where she associated them, them with the crows, the, this painting, the close up frame, making them metonymical of the Nazi oppression, does repeat the child's perspective. Moreover, she assaults it with a title, which makes a direct reference to the children's tale once upon a time. Charles Doshkami had perceived a link between the tales her mother was constantly telling her and the reality she was, she was facing. Or she also may have elaborated this analogy afterwards. But in doing so, she maintained the illusion of a non-elaboration, which is another common process of con concentration in written memoirs. One of the most striking effects of Charles Doshkami's herb and the more commented is that the images she produced seem to have been made as, a, as if the time did not pass. Some of her nightmarish visions may echo fairy tale characters, here the ogre one, <coughs> but their realism is accentuated by their inescapable presence, both in the sense that they occupy the vision and that they do so in present time. The trauma appears as if it were encapsulated, as the time uh, had no effect on it, right? Salim Correlo Mendoza. This presence, which partially uh, abolished the chronology, can also be detected in many survivors' memoirs, among them in Charlotte Delbo, Delbo's, who currently, uh, recurrently results to hypothesis using present tense, a stylistic device that corresponds to one of her deepest feelings that even if she survived, she never came back from Auschwitz. A similar feeling also schemes Chaya Stoshka poetic. Uh, an observation uh, shared by Chaya Stoshka was more childish composition when she adopts a bird eye view and a hierarchical perspective, like, for example, Thomas Geber, reinforces 
this feeling of straight contemporaneity. Her visual choices then provide fruitful insight about the channels of remembrance, but not, as, not necessarily at the expense of the drawing in testimonial content. The blondness of the majority of the depicted guards, female guards in Ravensburg, is not recorded by chance. In this respect, another representation of them, more individualized here, is even close to a portrait. Chais, uh, considering sorry, the importance she gives to the figure, she could refer to Dorothea Abins, who became in August 1943 head of the uh, Ravensburg Guards, female guards. It could also represent Irma Gesser, who was nicknamed the Blonde Angel of Auschwitz, where she arrived in March 1943, when Chai Soshka was deported there and who has been fed previously by Vince in Ravensburg. Anyhow, this picture does not allow an identification as clear as some of other drawings were made, uh, like those made in Auschwitz by the anonymous drawer uh, sketcher M.M., in which survivors recognized some of their torturers. As the time passed, the Auschwitz sketchbook appeared to be no less valuable for the faces and attire, he quote, of the perpetrator's victims. On the contrary, one of the most moving pictures made in the camps, and in this case in Buchenwald after the Polish political prisoner Josef China was transferred there from Auschwitz Wigner, turns out to be adverse to the genre of the portrait. The faces have been replaced here by fingerprints and managed to treat them informally and individually at the same time. Chaya Stoshka, a recurrent user of her finger to paint, is well known, but only in a few months of her picture, she uses fingerprints to feel faces like Shaina's did. On more occasion, notably, in what has been called a uh, black manner, since she opts for uh, India ink instead of acrylic colors or gouache, Charles Toshka gets very close to abstraction, as, and as a consequence, she moves away from testimony, at least apparently. Against the previous background, the handprints can be considered as negative or positive of Chaya Soshka's representation of her mutilated red forearm with a tattooed number written on it. In 1995, on the occasion of one of the first interviews Chaya Soshka gave about her book to Karen Rosenberg, she wrote that many of Stoshka, uh, Karen Rosenberg wrote that many of Stoshka's anecdotes had the quality of parables, they cast a moral light. But to avoid any misunderstanding. One should add that she never considers the parable to be her goal. In that respect, her capacity to produce allegory is always counterweight but her, by her ability to remain elusive. This precision is crucial when the viewer is facing seven of her pictures, especially the one referring to the gas chambers. The mixed technique picture entitled Gas Chamber on August 2nd, 1944, Final Liquidation, makes a clear reference to the slaughtering of the last ethnies in the, in the Auschwitz Vietnam Tigener Lager during the night of August 2nd, 1944. According to the different information at all this puzzle, it is not clear if Chaya Stoshka was still or not in Auschwitz Vietnam at this date. This is, um, but so we don't know if she could have witnessed, no, we know that she could not have witnessed what happened to her fellows in the gas chamber. No one could except the SS. This is the reason why uh, gas killing has been hardly uh, ever represented and their scarce representation abundantly criticized. It is the case for the most famous one, made in 1947 by David Oler, a former member of the Zander Commando, who survived, and for less known one by Polish resistance Viktor Siminski in Sachsenhausen. It is to me ambiguous that Charles Toshka's picture cannot be reasonably compared to these two examples. Indeed, in no manner her painting claims that she has witnessed the scene she depicts, neither she, she saw the victim's face. They compose an, in, an indiscernible crowd of men, women, children. It is not again to undermine her will to testify. The baby someone carries above his head is a detailed detail that contradicts the abstraction of the war. The fact that she mentions in the title the place, the date, and the cause reinforces the drawing testimonial content. But it does so in a way when the testimony are simply moved towards the memorial in order to commemorate precisely what happened this day. She talks for people not only about what she personally experienced. 
The same can be said for an instance for you, David Brown, who uh, has two titles for this brand, his father's face, or in memory of the Czech envoy sent to the gas chamber, made in 1945, but after an, an episode which took place in Auschwitz, Birkenau. When Stasoska depicts a father dying with a child, as if they were eventually reunited in, in, in death, she convokes again the barbed wire crows, as you can see, perhaps a scene she witnessed or dreamed of. But what is sure is that uh, she did witness the endless agony of Bergen Bells and Abandon Camp prior to the liberation by the Anglo Canadian troops in April 1945. The photographs that were widely taken by them are among the most terrible due to, among other things, the number of corpses lying in the camps when the, and the survivors among them. I quote Taya Stoshka, At the liberation, one has to imagine the soldiers' screams when they saw the camp. So many corpses. The soldiers who were touching us to know if we were real, if we were alive. They could not understand that we were li living among the corpses, that alive people stay among the, the dead. They were crying and yelling. In the end, we missed them after the liberation, the dead. They were our protectors, and they were human beings, people we knew. And we weren't alone because of the so many souls swelling all around. Always, when I come back to Bergen Belsen, it is like a party. The dead fly in a flutter of wings. They get out, they wiggle, I feel them, they sing, and the sky is full of birds. And of course, in this work, Chaya Stoshka does report on this situation. She depicts the inconceivable number of dead people. This depiction would be the testimonial part of the picture she made. But she does more. On the corpse's pile, she deposited a tree branch, a big tree branch that is always visible on a smaller scale on the lower right corner of all of her pictures. She explained that this branch saved her life in Bergen Belsen when she broke it and sucked the sack. This is why the branch figure accompanies all her pictures as an artist in Pesa, but also as a biographical detail, and it is in, in this case as a way to pay homage to the dead, to cover the state of nakedness in which they were discovered, to preserve their existence, to remember that they croaked and that they should li have life, and draw what they like. And draw what she liked, even death. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. It was a great presentation. And um, so I asked Florida and Karina to present. And the title is. It is difficult to write about some things, but it has to be. Chaya Stoika's notebooks. No? So, hello, everybody. Please wake up. <laughs> last time. No. <laughs> Sorry. No, but so it's the last, the one of the last sessions today, and we know it's a long day, but it's very interesting when you're going to talk about it. <laughs> 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 I don't know. It's always the last yeah. one, but it's the last So, um, uh, Renaud is one of the most influential Romani artists, writers, and spokespeople, Jess Wecker, has garnered acclaim to exhibitions of for artworks internationally. When Chaya Stoika died in 2013, uh, she left behind a massive collection of thousands of artworks and manuscripts documenting her rich life. Curators, art collectors, and scholars have just begun to assess the extent of this collection, largely located in the Viennese apartment of her son and daughter-in-law, Hoida and Chaya Stoika, <coughs> and owned by them. In 2018, we founded the Chaya Stoika International Fund, trying to preserve and diffuse information on the life and work of the artist and provide support to the family. The pictorial work entered only recently in the world of art collections, notably into the public fund of the National Museum Neuna Sophia in Madrid in 2020. No Austrian national museum has so far acquired works of Chai Right now, in June 2022, this week, 
The work is being presented at Art Basel in Switzerland, one of the most uh, world's most influential international art fairs by a Parisian gallery. And I want to add one sentence is also this ambiguous uh, view on an artwork of Charles Reckon being exposed to one of the most influential uh, art fairs. Uh, the work of Charles Reckon experiences an ambivalent development between acknowledgement of her memories and inflation on the art market. Among this treasure trove of multidisciplinary artwork are 33 notebooks that Stoika began creating in the mid 80s and continued until the end of her life. To open any page of these personal documents is to open a page into fascinating cultural and historical insights that are richly relevant today as they, as, they, as they were during the decades of her creation. They are composed of prose, poetry, uh, phrases, illustrations, titles, singular, singular words, and expressions, originally in German and Romani. Stoika's notebooks can be described as a vivid example within the history of Roma in Austria and Europe and as a conglomerate of art, literature, and social and political commentary. The spiral bound notebooks, where you find here, I think we should, yeah, we should this all this were the, the words. The other yeah, the words. Um, oh, here we are. Uh, the spiral bound notebooks, like pa uh, paper, are especially fragile. We borrowed some original examples from the family to have a hands-on example during the workshop. Um, my first contact with the family and the work of Giant Stocker happened to be in 2015 by Pierre Azar. Uh, working as a liaison between the curators, the exhibition centers, and the Stoica family. I regularly read through uh, the notebooks, which had their place in the cupboard in between the living room and the kitchen <laughs> in Hardas and Nuna's apartment. I became more and more conscious about the importance of this part of her life when she was writing regularly in the notebooks. In 2018, I applied and received funding from the Zukunftsfonds of the Republic of Austria and the French Antoine de Valbert Foundation to archive and digitally preserve high-quality images of the notebooks in order to guarantee the legacy of, the, of, his, of, of this testimony. As a second step in this preservation process, an index on the content was created. Jaya Stoika had already published her memoirs in three books in 1988. This is what we show here. So 1992 and 2005. Still, the lesser known unpublished notebooks are an imaginary source of information about the last 30 years in Jaya's work and her reflections on contemporary Austrian, European, and global events. Meticulously and almost daily, she describes insights into her world of thoughts as if writing in a diary. In the beginning, the entries of her um, memories depict mostly experience in the concentration camps from the point of view of an adult woman who assumes the perspective of a child again. She relates her reminiscence in a clear, unfiltered manner. This perspective changes in later notebooks as the writing begins begin to relate more current events that are preoccupying her. While she deals with the resonant situation emotionally, she also writes socially critical commentary. Political reflections play an essential role, especially in connection with the change of government in the conserv and the conservative and extreme right-wing black-blue coalition that was formed in 2000 in Austria. Beyond Austrian politics, Chaya Stoika also takes a position on issues on the international area, for example, when she analyzes the war situation in ex Yugoslavia and various media reports on global topics such as climate change. In addition, providing insights into Chaya Stoika's world of thought, the notebooks are funds of information about her personal art network, acquaintances, key cultural, poly political figures, and family. Alongside the written notes, songs, and poems, a pair of drawings add visual aesthetic contexts, which make, contexts which make the notebooks particularly appealing. The drawings appear on the side, on, of, on top of, beneath, and within texts. Often she continues her written thoughts through creating caricatures on depicting trees, landscapes, and people. This took the position of graphic and written portrayals and the symbolics and symbiosis on the written and the visual make Child Stoika's notebooks an exciting, unusual, and multi-dimensional piece of artwork and historical documentation. 
So we do have some examples that we'd like to present. Um, the first pages we've selected to present at this workshop convey the significant link between Chaya Stoika's published writings for visual artworks and her notebooks, and thereby bring to the forefront the necessity of examining all facets of her works in a complete corpus. The two pages here are dated 10-10-1995, and we refer to these as her testament, testament because she bequeaths, in her words, and I quote, the rights to my painted things, the pictures, and the literature that is my inheritance to my children. Willibald Stoika, Sylvia, family-in-law, Jürgen Stoika, and my grandchildren, who are here now and who will still come. Um, we do have the, this is in small, but, um, the original camera. yeah, but this was the, the, this is how it looks, um, transcribed and then with the English translation, but maybe I, oops, maybe I keep it on this page <coughs> here. Um, after first describing what she calls my biography, the book, Wir Leben Verborgenen, or We Live in Secrecy, which appeared in 1988, she subsequently refers to the feel psychic in a multifaceted way she has taken with her creativity. She gives credit to Carmen Berger, not only as editor of her biography, but as a person, quote, like my own child, who, quote, knows everything about me and who will live on in her capacity as what she calls her advisor and purveyor of Chaya Stoika's words and deeds. Our presentation's title cites the sentence at the top of the second page, Quote, it is so difficult to write about some things, but it has to be. Visually, the sentence stands out for its boldness. The darker ink indicates that Chaya has obviously pressed the pen down hard onto the paper while writing these words. And it's double underlying lines. Give, given her prolific writing, she clearly is not referring to the difficulty in carrying out the physical act of writing, but rather the mental challenges of recalling, formulating, reworking, and setting into permanent form her memories of dark times. The testament is a personal one to her family, but it's also a public one to the so-called larger society. As she pleads never, and she underlines that very clearly here, there, Nimal's that we should let her work rest and to exhibit her paintings. This is the way her children will survive, a survival based not, on, not only on material goods, food and shelter, but rather on words, images, stories and histories. She warns that if we, the larger public, do not and cannot record and preserve her voice, really her individual voice and those of Romani collectives, Future generations of Romani cannot survive. While these two pages do not have the striking visual pictorial images that appear on so many pages that will be prominent in the next pages that Karina will talk about, the spacing of the words and lines resembles those of a poem. And when read aloud, adopt a poetic cadence demanding accents and pauses, accentuated by punctuated words repeated in expanded clarifying phrases. As an example, I will read from the first part in German, noting the breakdown of syllables in each line and the total number of syllables in each section. Or if one analyzes this as a poem, in each stanza, which increases from 10 to 13 to 15 lines. Es begann mit meiner Biografie ein kleines Buch, Tito. Wir leben im Verborgenen. Herausgeberin ist Karin, Frau Dr. Karin Werner. The mere visual presentation of the words for the entire text as it builds up from sentence to sentence and then to finally much denser block at the end underscores the urgency of the message and of her bequest. As her words and messages multiply, so do the generations of people who must hear them. So now to the next example, we have three. 
He selected another work that stands out through its abstract artistic expression of text. You can see a double page of a notebook from 1999, from 11th of August, here on the right side. Um, the text says, uh, quote, in the year 2000, the earth will be, we don't know exactly, 8, um, 11, 1999, God closes his eyes, he forgives those people on earth. Uh, Charles Michael was 66 years old in 1999. The artist describes black circles that probably correspond to the earth and nature on the left side, um, while the right side probably depicts the planet Earth from outside. We can see stars and two eyes. God looks at the earth from outside, while she writes below, God closes his eyes, he forgives those people on earth. In August 1999, the whole world was wondering about prophecies about what might cure when the world switched from 1900s to the 2000s. It's a daily subject in the news, and Chaya Stoika was listening daily to Radio TV. An important part of the notebooks is composed of comments on what she heard and saw on TV and radio. Second, nature played a dominant role in Chaya's life. She was raised in nature, and she held onto nature, and when she was in the camps, and she expressed both uh, her relief and her concern about nature and climate change in her books and in novels. Third, Chai was a religious person and in her entire life often refers to God and his supremacy of a manhood, but also continually asked the question, why? Directly addressed to God. Both notions, religion and nature, are belong together in this picture. Last, it is worth cross-linking her artistic work and this notebook entry from the days around the 11th of August 1999. It was a period of active creation. At least two works, one of them in ink thank you, and paper and one acrylic on canvas were painted within several days around the 11th of August. The ink painting shows a scene of nude and emaciated people surrounded by barbed wire who want to scream out but the mouth of one figure is shut by a hand. She has stated the drawing on the 11th of August, uh, 1999. The other painting, Die Schöne von Auschwitz, The Beauties of Auschwitz, dates from the 16th of August. The work de depicts atrocities in, atrocities in Auschwitz of nude, horrified women on a black background, mixing life and death. The artist's <coughs> perspectives in conveying the expressions in both works are completely different. On the one hand, in the artwork on canvas and paper, the atrocities are shown directly, frontally, depicting a specific moment. On the other hand, in a private notebook, the author's perspective on the world is completely detached, looking on the world from very far away, talking about God forgiving all people on the earth. Taken together, both the records are interesting examples of Chaya Stoichi's artistic balancing act between head-on confrontation with her lived experiences and distanced state of mind of being above those experiences. The third example uh, epitomizes the concurrent uh, combination of juxtaposition of text and visuals that characterize so many of the notebook pages but also highlights the importance of China's voicing herself in the, her mother language, the Black Roman language of the Lovari, and thereby preserving a major part of her, of the collective heritage. The visual of the left side shows a person, a woman or a girl, who carries wood, walking on a wild landscape. A text in Roman in German says, she's carrying wood from, quote, she's carrying wood from far away and the wind is blowing. It is, compared to the extract example before, a very figurative image describing the situation and adding another dimension into two dimensional drawing, giving the image a texture. The wind is blowing. The text on the right side could be read both as a poem, as with the testament, as well as a lexicon, whereby individual words and phrases in Romani are translated line by line into German. Not sure you can see that too much, but it's separated by a backslash. In many ways, she seems to be creating a kind of corpora as used in corpus linguistics, whereby naturally occurring spoken and written texts, phrases, and words are collected for analyzing language usage. 
Chaya often included Romani words and phrases in and on the backs of her artworks, and her memoirs are likewise peppered with sentences and sayings in Romani. In this way, she engages in a kind of code switching, which often characterizes orality in Romani texts and performances. Being bilingual in both German and Romani, Chai appears to be giving a lesson for a readership that most likely does not know Romani, rather than exercising her own language knowledge. Language preservation and transmission seem to be at the core of this entry as she appeals to public readers that may not understand Romani. Um, I see we're kind of running out of time, so maybe I skip to a bit of this. Um, but in pre briefly presenting just three of these many thousands of notebook pages, we already encountered several challenges to disseminating the notebooks, um, which we'd just like to discuss a bit, and maybe we can open it up in the discussion for your, your opinion and, and advice. Um, as you can discern from the three examples, Stoya's right, um, Stoika's writing does not follow orthographic rules for standard German. As an autodidact, she was denied schooling when she was younger, and she entered the third grade at the age of, uh, second grade at the age of 12, right after the war. She writes, uh, she often speaks, and frequently spells phonetically and employs a stream of consciousness style with little or no punctuation. Indeed, she often admits how uncomfortable she feels about making mistakes in writing and orthography in the notebooks. And when she turns 70 years old, she says it's fine to make mistakes. We've transcribed the samples into standard German for ease of reading and translating. If future projects include transcriptions, we'd have to decide based on consultation whether they will remain true to the original or use standard German. While we want to convey Stoika's voice as authentically as possible, we also recognize the danger in making her appear as if she could not speak or write well, a false impression that could unfortunately play into derogatory stereotypes about exotic so-called gypsies. Yeah. To reach, reach a larger audience, accompanying English um, translations with the original German text would also be ideal, but the same challenges of authenticity would also arise. Um, another challenge is the actual calling of them, the notebooks. Um, she herself writes often, refers to them as Büchlein, or little booklets, or Buch, or Heft, as notebooks. Um, we've decided to call them notebooks for now, um, just to fit them in with a kind of um, corpus of artistic notebooks. And for that, we tried to find some possible examples to look into. Uh, for instance, the notebooks of Frida Kahlo, Leonardo da Vinci, William Blake. They got cut off here. Um, many others, but um, to our knowledge, it's hard to find, or if anybody else knows, any Romani people, writers, activists, artists, survivors of the genocide who have created such um, notebooks. Mm -hmm. should, it, we, yeah. we will not skip Anne Frank, really, but it's another a re reference we, we think of, but it's very, it's very different. But we, can, we don't have time to go into it. So I just finished uh, the last. Paragraph and I know. Uh, so we know we know of not enough this by Romani artists, writers, activists, and uh, does just like as not books because wider dissemination. We're actively searching for funding to publish notebooks in an appropriate format. Publishing relevant notebook excerpts alongside corresponding artworks would eliminate Stoika's artistic process and historical testimony of contemporary history and provide a vital opportunity for aesthetic, literary, and historical enjoyment, as well as preservation, refer references, and referencing, and further research. To achieve this goal, however, publishers might need a more exact focus for marketing purposes. Just like this multifaced life experiences and creative production, on the one hand, left uh, defy limitations, and on the other hand, expands scholarly dis disciplinary discourse. Her works fit into the wide range of subjects, including Romani studies, Holocaust studies, art history, visual arts, history, literature studies, linguistics, and language studies, etc. Uh, the format of the dissemination also requires thoughtful consideration on the potential short-term and long-term audience. A combination of life and digital exhibition, where, whereby audiences could view the vast extent of the notebooks, is conjunction with, uh, in conjunction with Stoika's impressive artworks and life experiences, both in person and online, would be ideal. 
Our own preliminary discussions with administrators in the art of museum world, however, have confirmed that COVID has caused major backlogs in exhibition planning and art publications and finally financial instability, creating cautious hesitation on take on new projects. The wealth of, of material in the notebooks also demands a team with the appropriate scholarly expertise, time and funding, which would have give would to give special consideration on contextualization of material especially within Austrian and European history and Romani cultures, to linguistic idiosyncrasies and to the sensitive private material. We hope our presentation gives a sense of the wealth, importance and necessity of recording Stoker's voice through her notebooks. We welcome your ideas to the next step of making these invaluable valuable documents available to a wider public. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so our next and final presentation for today is uh, from Stefan Benedi. And the title of the presentation is Unpredicted Agents of Memory, Self-Representation, and mainstreaming of the suffering in Austrian national memory. Do you need help? Um, I almost. Uh, probably <laughs> yes. No. Probably yes. Okay. No. I'm the best. In that. <laughs> <laughs> Looks as if. Yes. There we are. Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. So you have time. We are not in a hurry. That's good. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> Let's try once again to have a full screen. Wait, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think you have to do this. Right, and then full screen. So. Uh, thank you very much for not only the invitation, but for most of all, um, putting together this uh, conference that has been so inspiring since the very first panel uh, this morning, and also for bringing together productively those contradictions between Similarly, between an activist and a an historian position, between like more conceptual questions and more like um, yeah, positivistically um, historical questions, um, in which I'm going to position myself quite uh, clearly. I hope, although I'm a historian by training, <laughs> of which I'm not so <laughs> proud, I guess. Um, <laughs> So, in my presentation, I'm going to try to connect uh, to the previous papers and I'm also going to try to do something different in terms that I'm trying to reflect on how Romani activists, um, including but also going beyond Chaya, uh, managed to change Austrian memory politics and the landscape of national memory um, at large. Um, and in that, my main argument will be that, um, on one hand, uh, in the Austrian case, it is probably quite significant that they were the community activists themselves that established new standards in oral history, while on the other hand, they have been largely ignored or even problematized by academia. So ideally, this should be talked about by one of those Romani activists, who I am not. Uh, but given that there is no interpreting at this workshop, um, yeah, in the end, I, I decided to, to somehow put together my thoughts on this. Um, and this is why I have to make transparent that my position is inside of this like memory um, culture complex, given that I'm a curator at the Austrian National Museum of Contemporary History, at which um, we bought a couple of works by Chaya Stoika. So there is a National ah. Museum, <laughs> and there is also the City Museum of Vienna, yes, who okay. bought, which is also like an institution, like an official state institution. It's not a national, but um, given, given the organization, I, I think it's quite significant. So I focus now on voice in a larger conceptual sense, 
um, but also on how and when Romani activists managed to challenge prevailing mechanisms in historical narratives and how they responded to dynamics of silencing, of marginalization, and on other aspects of the complex power structures that are so constitutive to, to memory debates. So I'm not going to talk about um, memorials today, uh, but I'll start with them anyways, um, because I'd like to introduce you to my topic with two overviews. One of them is going to be memorials and the other one um, is exhibitions and give you a short overview over how those connect to Romani memorial activism and Romani testimonies. Um, so if we just look on the uh, region of, of Burgenland, which is in the very east of Austria, the historical region with the by far largest uh, Roman community, um, the image is quite clear. Um, as you see here, up to 2006, there were actually just two memorials there. Um, one is an immediate result of, um, of the dedicated work of uh, a a historian of contemporary history, a political scientist Erika Durner, who um, wrote about a specific campsite at which then there was a memorial, and the other one um, in Oberwart, the largest, let's say the most prominent Romani um, settlement, as it was called in Austria. Um, there, the memorial was an immediate result of the shift of memory politics after the Cold War. Um, in Austrian uh, terms, the so-called Wahlheim debate, which also connects immediately to uh, Chaya's first book um, in 88. So this is two memorials in which Romani people were practically not involved. And that changed immediately 16 years afterwards when Romani activists themselves demanded an entirely different approach um, they demanded a memorial that should be local, um, that should be situated at the site of uh, survivors or of their relatives, but also, of course, at the site where relatives of the perpetrators or sometimes the perpetrators themselves um, still lived. And as you can see here, initially, this was not very successful. Um, but uh, recently, it has become extremely successful. These are just the last 12 months. And as you can see, in all of those local communities, um, there are now um, uh, there are now memorials that is also connected to uh, work of back to the long-standing work of, of historians, among them Gerhard Baumgartner, who uh, published uh, an almost encyclopedic work on uh, actually proving that in each and every of those um, villages, there has been a Romani community. And so this connects to the Romani um, activism um, at site. But what I want to highlight here is that in all of those examples, the Romani activists were not limited to symbolically spokespeople or even worse to the musicians at the inauguration, but they actually had a vital role um, in the conceptualization. Um, in negotiating the wording um, of those memorials and then in the inaugurations. So they were the central spokespeople. Um, and this also, of course, connects not only to voice in a post-colonial sense, but also to giving testimony there. Uh, and now, as you can see in the very uh, left corner, now there is a debate um, uh, yet starting, I think, about a national uh, central memorial. Uh, a similar image um, could also be seen when we look at um, exhibitions. Um, initially, Romani people um, were included, but um, they were given voice in the sense, um, yeah, in in which the 70s thought of those terms. Um, it is therefore important to, to honor the achievements of the Documentation Center of Austrian Resistance, um, the DEF, where the pioneer, uh, sorry, the pioneer work of Selma Steinmetz meant that this was one of the 
like first exhibitions ever that included Romani victims in a chapter that was interestingly titled Resistance of National Minorities already in 70, um, in 78. But of course, Romani agency in the terms in which we think of it now <coughs> was not um, included um, back then. It was only, um, it came only <coughs> In, in an exhibition in 2015, uh, which was called uh, Roma de Dada, and which to me um, felt like a, like a breakthrough, because since then, um, not a single bigger historical exhibition has been um, set up in which Romani spokespeople have not been integrated in one or the other sense. Like um, they were either included as, um, as uh, like by or history, but often they also have been in included in terms of uh, co-curating. And this is actually something I also expect for upcoming exhibitions, as I uh, mentioned here, the um, the upcoming exhibition, new permanent exhibition of the Historic Museum of the City of Vienna. Um, I'm not going to bore you with um, an embedding of this in the larger development of awareness for Romani Austrians as victim of national socialism, but I would like to highlight two aspects when looking at, at this chronology. Um, first, it was the heterogeneous uh, Romani movement in Austria that from its very start focused on heterogeneous um, like experiences um, in Nazi persecution. So uh, in other words, and more bluntly, the Austrian case is very different from the German case um, in that. And second, uh, these achievements are due to broader shifts in memory cultures after the end of the Cold War and the development of a European memory of Nazi atrocities. However, in Austria, the dedication of uh, Roman survivors themselves plays an enormous role. So it has to do a lot with individual agency, um, and we are talking here about Chaya Stoika, but not only about her. Um, and I'm trying to give you now three examples in reverse chronology, starting with the most recent one. Um, in 2019, uh, the city-based art festival Wienwoche hosted a temporary uh, memorial um, called the uh, Krena Vista, which you can see here. Uh, which was dedicated to the August 2nd uh, Memorial Day. Uh, the project itself was set up and created by the Roma Genocide Remembrance uh, Initiative, which was founded in 2010 and is closely related to the activists of the Roma Youth, of the, of the Damnibel Network. And what it did was it negotiated this productive space in between the temporal and permanent between memorial and project, between the national and the transnational. And interestingly, despite its ephemeral character, um, it, pro it paved the way for the debate about the central memorial for Romani victims in Austria, which is quite paradoxical because the project itself did not adhere to the national framework. It did not try to establish an Austrian um, national mem uh, memorial, and also it avoided the visual language of a monument memorial, uh, which has been so dominant recently. Recently, And a third aspect that is quite um, uh, important to my reading is, if you look at intersectional aspects, you see here that um, Black, both Romani and non-Romani activists um, and women played a prominent role um, in the whole project, such a prominent that there was not a single um, male speaker at the whole inauguration event, which seems quite uh, significant. Um, however, also the like, more traditional Austrian Romani movement or the Austrian Romani movement in a narrower sense of the word, let's say, uh, actively changed the visibility of Romani people in Austrian memory politics. And a project which I want to highlight here because it is often overseen and overlooked 
um, is uh, the 2009 oral history project, Mri Historia, um, translating as My History, uh, which was carried out by the Bunyan based um, Romani NGO Roma service. Um, and there, the activists, they, like Romani and non Romani activist researchers, scientifically documented and disseminated the life accounts of survivors and also of some of their relatives. Um, and interestingly, the publication then did not focus on like an overarching history of the Romani genocide, but instead it published individual memories as individual memories, like individually um, as, uh, as, yeah, single papers, uh, as single volumes even. So, the project itself can hardly be overrated, not only because it was virtually the last chance to record uh, the accounts of a couple of survivors, but even more, I would like to emphasize how innovative the Marie Historia project was, even as part of the actually quite extensive scholarly research on the persecution of Romani Austrians. So it was nothing new, but there were aspects they highlighted which have never been actually spoken out before. Most prominently, they broke the taboo the or at least the silence on the question of uh, Romani victim perpetrators. So in the very first volume, um, they openly stated at, as the most prominent example of why this is important, that uh, it is now time to also talk about um, the complicity of Romani victims in the persecution, uh, namely the couples, uh, the Romani couples. And this has been tackled by historians, by non-Roman historians, but like very um, cautiously. So here you saw also the benefit of uh, uh, a Romani position and how it can actually bring the debate forward. Um, such evident merit of the project is actually in stark contrast to the rejection it received by professionals, especially um, many individuals in the academic community. While nobody would admit it publicly, academic historians have not only largely ignored it, but sometimes even uh, presented the project as a reason for an assumed need to professionalize oral history um, on Romani persecutions. And this seems odd um, as the people involved have been actually trained um, during interviews and it clearly met uh, standards regarding, for instance, transparency, um, methodology, and so on. And to conclude with my final examples, um, I'll briefly talk about um, a person we heard a lot about already in this panel, um, but I want to quickly connect Chaya Stoika um, to the fundamental shift in Austrian memory politics, uh, which came in 1986 to 1988, um, when Chaya Stoika published uh, the memoir called Relief and Seclusion. Um, this influenced the debates on Romani victims and the and changed uh, the position of Romani speakers in multiple ways, among which I will just pick out three. Um, first, I would like to um, emphasize how the text relates the agency of a female child in extermination and concentration camps. Um, this narrative made traditional uh, gendered stereotypes less powerful Thus, it irritated the trope of the silent, of the powerless um, victim. Second, um, by Chaya became prominent, she rejected the role as a central spokesperson. Um, also, she was indirectly challenged by a few other Roman survivors, among them her brothers. And this paved the way for a memory culture that is shaped by the diversity of voices, by diverse experiences by um, diverse and challenging interpretation. And third, uh, she was a role model in how she understood her position as a survivor, especially as an Auschwitz survivor, who always um, absolutely refused to be reduced to the position of the historical witness only, and always tried to talk about 
contemporary challenges, contemporary inequality, contemporary um, unjust, this is also contemporary violence, uh, which often made it difficult um, in uh, journalist settings, um, but which actually um, proved that there was a connection between history and contemporary um, persecution, and that is something um, she insisted on quite productively, and that made politics more active. And this is where I'm going to um, conclude with just stating the central paradox I tried um, to show, that while those Romanian um, activists were often quite successful in, um, in actually changing how Austrian public and also international publics spoke about Nazi persecution, um, in professional academia, um, and in academic settings, often their very achievements that could be extremely beneficial for an academic examination and analysis have not yet been uh, largely dealt with. Thank you. Uh, I need to do something here where it disappears. So, okay, yeah. You can just go. Okay. Um, so, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, so, I would like to ask the audience to, to ask questions, but um, I just um, kind of conclude. So, we were, if you fall asleep a little bit, just, just a reminder that. We were listening to uh, <laughs> we were listening to uh, some very uh, great, actually, uh, so much layers uh, of your presentations, like and of your researches you have. So um, basically, as I understand it, um, the representation of Holocaust uh, through Chair Stoika's work, and also. I think uh, your work, I don't know if you're going to uh, develop it to a proper paper, but it has so many layers. We just listen, we could just listen to uh, the representation of, uh, of us, right? Our um, new, <laughs> the new generation of, uh, of uh, Romani um, activists and scholars. And also um, that the, the representation of uh, of um, of the voice of color through uh, Holocaust, which is like a dominant uh, um, topic uh, in our in in uh, in our new a uh, new wave of uh, activism. Uh, so it's, um, it's 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 like it's very interesting how you are perceiving us and perceiving this as a historian. And um, I'm also always talking about the present, but I've never heard historians talking about the present or risking it and <laughs> analyzing it. So it was cool. And so, um, uh, well, uh, about the autobiography, um, uh, autobiographies, it's um, actually, you can also uh, look at them afterwards if we have time. It's like some of the pieces are here and I've never seen them like this uh, before. Um, so you were asking also the question like, uh, or like, um, yeah, but what do you think, uh, um, how could you, like, as I understand you are, you try to um, kind of institutionalize or a uh, chair Stoika's work, or at least to, to like approach like uh, a chair Stoika's work as a, as a, um, as a, like documentations that, that should be in the, in the canon of like in the history like the historians are using as well so what could be the next step for you just to to get this recognition what do you think and then uh well uh yeah and then uh and then Paul's, uh i really liked your presentation it was a very uh a meditative analysis about uh the uh the work of uh chester or or how the representation of Holocaust can be can be um, understood through his, her work. Or at least uh, when I'm talking about representation, I always say that uh, it's your understanding about her work. And for me, it, and especially for 
both of you. It's always always fascinating to, um, you know, we when we are talking about representation, and now we are referring to Stuart Hall. Then we we are talking about the truth, like we are tr trying to understand what is um, what is the meaning. So um, you give different meanings to her work, but um, for me, it's uh, very interesting that how to um, so these are interpretation that how could it be used as like some historians appeared here in this conference. Yeah. Have, so for them who are always talking about being objective, so you are kind of cha uh, challenging uh, the field of history in this sense. And um, well, I think it's a, it's it's a, it's very progressive. But uh, what do you think? How could you progress, or how how, how where do you find your work like? How could, what, what could you reach with your work in this term? So these are just my general like insight and uh, understanding about your work. And I don't know, the historians here, <laughs> if you want to speak up, or what do you think? Uh, so you can see, right, that art is not only just... Um, Okay, stop. <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's um it's actually an important part of our work, um, in representation. And I also call my my peers who are uh, who are digging this field of representation, uh, to uh, to give an insight or just an opinion about this. And also our only one art historian scholar here. Oh. Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> if I could just say um, that story, because we didn't mention that. I mean, we did bring these also to show you that the family let us use these. And mm -hmm. Chaya herself has um, given them. When I had an exhibit in the U.S., she, she gave them to transport. So they are not necessarily private documents. They were... Mm -hmm. You know, sort of. Can, can you touch them people or not? Would, well, I hate to say with historians, <laughs> you maybe might, you know, want to say, but, um, you know, just the feeling that the family and she, I do think, wanted them to be seen. They, they, they wanted them somehow to be disseminated. You know, I can't necessarily talk about intentions too much, but um, they're definitely something that. I believe she and the family would, would like to to share, and they've been exhibited other places too. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So the first one was there in the back. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thank you all for your presentations. I just had a question to the those who kind of have the foundation and sell the work. How is the reception of China's work at international level? Is it that she is seen as a woman artist, a Holocaust survivor, or a woman artist, or also a rabbit you know, what is the reception of what we did in the models? And uh, just one thing to, um, to add, because it is important to Chaya Stoika and Vienna, is that uh, also because of memorialization, it's interesting that in the Senate district there is a place uh, for it after her, so there's a Chaya Stoika. We're going to go there afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we are going to visit this, yeah. And this was actually, I think it's quite interesting because in the last presentation you mentioned that uh, there's a call for having a central uh, Holocaust memorial for Roma victims. When it started actually at the Chaya Stoika Platz in 2015, the Roma Jews asked there, um, you know, so it was a very I think, significant place. And to have the call out that we want the central memorial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make this connection because it can be very interesting. Okay, so let's collect questions and then afterwards, okay, we can go. Yeah, so, who is Verna? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I also have a question uh, for Laurie and Karina. Um, so, could you maybe uh, give an insight of how your foundation works? It used to cooperate with the family, the relatives, and how does that go uh, when you do projects? Um, I'd be really interested on um, on that. About that and um, just a brief remark because you were asking about other kinds of uh, notebooks or uh, diaries and uh, the lane of the bus uh, just had um, an exhibition and performance in the Borke Theater in Berlin. It was called uh, Linguistic Engineering and she was exhibiting reprints of her notebooks uh, from the past, from the pandemic basically. 
um, from the lockdowns and the whole exhibition was about that, um, how she dealt with it. And uh, the style is very um, close to uh, <laughs> the left one that you have on the table right now. Um, so it's not just notes, but it's also um, drawings, uh, sketchings, but uh, also different kinds of uh, tools, uh, watercolors, um, pencils, pens. And um, it's very interesting because it's very close to it, I think, what uh, you have over there. And uh, in this exhibition, she was also. Um, uh, dealing with uh, like her notebooks and um, the exhibition and the performance and the whole work was also about language use. So I think if you look for like other art projects and comparisons, um, that would be something very contemporary to look at. Can you just repeat the name? Um, so it's the name Labas uh, and um, Laba. Laba. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, and. Um, Exhibition is called Beware of Linguistic Engineering. And it was in like several dates in June uh, this year. But uh, the, um, it's a theater in Berlin, the uh, Maxim Gorky, the Gorky Theater. Yeah, Delaine Labar has exhibited widely in the UK. So oh. there was many previous uh, exhibitions of her in, in the United Kingdom as well. So, what, you go? Yeah. Uh, more than a question, I'd like to share with you some of the experiences I, I have had with the exhibition in Sevilla in Factoria Cultural, this kind of very humble cultural center. And, and it's funny because it's, there are many things that, um, in while explaining the exhibition to different kind of groups, many of, many of them Gitanos, some even some of them were even political refugees from uh, African countries. So many that meanwhile explaining the exhibition, I somehow had to go through many of the things that you, the three of you, have mentioned. And but there is something that it, that it's, it would make the, the difference. It, meanwhile, doing the exhibition in Madrid in the Centro de Arte Reina Sofia was kind of uh, an important uh, moment for, uh, for many of us, no? because that means the recognition of an artistic and an international artistic uh, institution. At the same time, um, it, it put our artists in a position that it, it, it is difficult to be reached by re really. Um, Around communities. No? So for me, it was a, ch like a, a challenge to bring the Che and Soika to, to the place where I work and live, which is really a complicated place. Um, and for me, it was important to tell them, to tell the, the people there that somehow uh, what I understood or what I, what I know or what I know in of the work and life of Che Stoika. Is that she combated the idea of that Romani painters, Romani artists are self taught and are in just naive and they are just, you know, mm -hmm. those That's wild, crazy. those wild gypsies with <laughs> are in their beings, no? So, and then also the idea of where, where her images came from was something important for me to try to explain to people. Because in, at the end of the visit we, we organized, we, we have a moment with, with the people in which we, we gave them the chance of answering Che Stoika through drawings. So I will love to show you in the future many of the um, drawings that people made, many of them Gitanos, were really, really powerful. And uh, that's something cool also like, okay, you see that this is also happening a new dimension or Romani subjectivity. And then uh, Eva. So thank you very much for all of uh, these very, very inspiring uh, uh, presentations. Um, you asked us whether we can have a, uh, give other examples about uh, writings and uh, paintings and the intersection between writing and we had a wonderful 
Roma artist in Hungary. The name is uh, uh, Omara. Uh, she died a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it would be interesting for you to see how written text uh, started, starts, starts to work as a painting. So if you need the text to understand the painting and vice versa. So I just ask you, I ask you uh, whether you can make kind of dialogue between the mm. between the memoir <coughs> and the paintings, and just read the painting with the help of the mem memoirs and bits of that. But I think it's really interesting from the gender perspective, from the perspective of, of a Roma uh, subaltern position. So we learn from Omara that the written text is the clue, the key. To the painting. So without the text, you cannot understand the painting. And the second is a question to to Stefan. Uh, just because you mentioned the uh, Selma Steinmetz, I and she was a, a Jewish uh, uh, Shoah survivor. Uh, I just wanted to ask you whether you have other examples uh, in which other survivor. Uh, representatives uh, took the responsibility, the position, the so did this task or this mission uh, to struggle for the recognition of the Roma genocide. Anna? Yeah. And uh, then, uh, okay. Okay. I just wanted to suggest, like, as you requested for suggestions, two other situations in which I saw diaries used in the same way. And one of them is Ai Weiwei's exhibition called Liberty of Doubt, where, and it's also a, a story of suffering because Ai Weiwei um, was beaten up by the Chinese police multiple times. And the exhibition Liberty of Doubt talks about his um, pro-democracy activism, but he also has a series of notebooks that go with, with it. Um, and um, they were banned in China. So they're currently in Cambridge in the UK where um, Ai Weiwei also lives. Um, and the other example is the exhibition Surrealism Beyond Borders at Fate Modern, which is ongoing now in, in London, um, where notebooks are part of the exhibition in the sense that, well, I mean, they're, they, they, you can see them there, but a lot, a lot of the artists that were... Um, exhibited in that exhibition were also, uh, for example, anti-colonial activists or anti-imperial activists or were um, activists against the idea of borders as well. So it, it's, you know, it's an art exhibition about surrealism, but it's also a political exhibition and um, diaries are a big part of that. And I just wanted to give my two cents on language and um, transcription. I think it would, in my view of the world, it would be wrong to standardize her German because there's not there's no one German, right? Like the idea of Hochdeutsch is a bit ridiculous anyway. I mean, I know it exists because I study <laughs> German as well, but um, language is a moving thing, right? And why standardize her German when other poets, for example, choose to not use punctuation because it's a, why is that an artistic choice and hers not an artistic choice, you know? So yeah, I mean, I understand trying to contradict that kind of stereotype but at the same time um she seems to not be a figure that needs um i don't know qualification like i don't know she's just she's her own thing she doesn't need to be in standardized german right um that's just my i thoughts on language <laughs> Anna? and then andrea so the panel was beautiful, I thought, because it allowed us to, to get closer to, to Stoica and from the writing, from the visual, and from the social political uh, that she encompassed. And, um, and actually, about what we were talking this morning, there is a difference when a survivor um, gives a testimony and when an artist survivor gives a testimony. And um, what Anna has <laughs> said, I actually thought it the other way when I was listening to Paul. I was, I was thinking, oh, I think those paintings are the key to the writings, right? Because um, 
I have read very, very little from Stoica because there is very little in translation and probably I'm looking forward to read your book, Carmen, but in Spanish, um, in the languages that I, that I can read, very limited, I, can, I have only uh, read her memoirs from uh, as a kid in Bergen-Belsen, right? Uh, all that. When you put that pictures of, um, of the dead, uh, just brought me to how in her testimony, <coughs> Um, it's not a factual testimony. She didn't go through this happened and this and that. It's about her, her memories, her images of what happened and how did that come. Um, she, she completely reused the image of the dead in Romani culture. And her, those, those dead people are her refuge, her constant uh, point of going back to safety, which is kind of stunning when you're really like, like She's signing refuge, a refuge, refugio, <laughs> in those dead people, and that's that was so moving, right? Like she's not talking about what happened in the chambers. What we know, in on the reader knows that she's talking about how she has processed that in her in her um, mind, that, and it's so beautiful and so moving. But we don't necessarily be emotional going to that detail, right? So thank you so much because really you displayed um, the strength of um, art and, and literature, and that's that's great. <laughs> thank you. And Andrea, thank you. We just keep asking, <laughs> but uh, this is a very short uh, question, which is connected actually to the very first question. Uh, and Simina's comment as well, uh, that I think the, the perception is very much uh, connected to the curating, I mean, the curatorial work. And if you've ever thought of examining the interpretational frameworks, uh, Chair Stoika was put in, in several exhibitions. That was my question. So thank you. Okay, so I give you... Well, it's okay. I mean, we have to be in Chair Stoika Platz around um, uh, 6.45 because uh, we're going to have dinner there at 7. So I'm not local, but I think it takes time to get there. But I give you like 5, 10 minutes to respond and we should go. <laughs> First question. Okay, so I try to get back to the question on the international perception of child soccer. And the second, what are we doing as the child soccer international family? Um, so um, it is quite, we have to be very short, it's difficult. Um, okay. No, no, no. <laughs> no, but. Um, uh, I'm in a difficult situation of being Austrian and living abroad since a long time, and we've been put in this situation from outside perspective. So um, I was a communicator between the family and the Parisian Museum and the Reina Sofia Museum and the Nijmegen Museum, etc. And uh, so I and I'm the kind of coordinator of the fund. So we, uh, I get email requests on researchers, journalists, on like a public that is interested in Jastroika and we're kind of the platform. Uh, that is our main goal to, to send these requests to the people who can uh, answer to it. So this is, this is our approach. Second approach is to give information on all what happens ar around Jastroika on an academic level, on an exhibition level, on an um, art fair, art market level, also a little bit on activist level, but this is not our main goal. We are not Roma, which we are <coughs> criticized for. There, is, there are two honorary members, three honorary members who are part of the fund, which is the Stoica family, and they are uh, like they represent the, 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 the family. But we are 10 people who are not from this community. So uh, we also want to, to have a certain distance. I think it's important to say. Um, 
And uh, so as a coordinator and of collecting all the information that comes uh, to us around the exhibitions, the international, um, we can maybe talk about the, the, the press references. When there was the exhibition in, uh, in Paris, there was lots of internet, lots of international uh, press, for example, and Rena Sofia as well. So there was the Guardian, New York Times, El País, Zeitz, uh, Süddeutsche Zeit. There were was really a very large um, uh, panorama from international, big international press, uh, and there was one uh, broadcast. <laughs> Uh, radio comment on Ö1, which is the national radio in Austria. It was. It is very interesting. During four years of, of perception of press on Star Trek, it's lots of international, but very few from Austria, as if it's uh, it, it was not there. And then it changed a little bit, and now since two years, there's a little bit more press uh, in Austria. But I think what happened is that. Chaya Stoika was very uh, famous, or she was really in, in, in the press in Austria in the 80s, 90s. There was also, like, she was an activist, and she was seen as a, as a and this is her double role of being a, a, a Holocaust survivor and an activist, and she was not seen as a painter or an artist. This is a picture which she got from outside a little bit. There was the museum um, in the Jewish Museum. There was an exhibition in 2004, as you mentioned. But um, she was put up in this artist level from outside by the. And this is so tricky. It's it's so hard to, to talk about it, but it has to be because uh, putting Chaya Stoika as an art artist on the art market is 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 um, is very ambivalent. And this is what how she became uh, successful as an artist, because there was a, a, a French uh, important collector, art collector, who bought works of art of Charles Dickens, and he put it in her his private museum. And then the curator of the Rena Museum, uh, Rena Sophia, saw it, and then he put it into Rena Sophia, and tak tak tak, and now it's an art basel. And so this is the perspective, uh, like it's 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 about referencing artworks. In which connection it is already, it entered already to, to be shown in another collection. Because if you have it, I also want it. And this is something what, what happens. I am a little bit criticizing it, of course, from our perspective, because we have no power. We are the Chester like International Fund, but we don't have, uh, we do not own artworks. It's all either, it's all private owned, some uh, public owned uh, artworks. But most of it, it's, it's private owned. We don't have the funds, and we ask the states, uh, Austrian states, uh, and we try to to get public funding. And I, I make the tour on every public museum in Austria, uh, an art museum. I have to also precise maybe <laughs> because that's different. That's also very important. But I just never get there. What where we said maybe someone of the public spectrum could just buy all the collection. So it gets out of the art market. This would be interesting, but it's not possible. So second, um, about just the perspective, and then I, I, I leave it. Um, is that, as you said, Maria, we want what what our intention is in a longer way is to change the art history canon to enter just like in this international canon of art history because. It's a global movement, and we just have to to get on this train. And uh, this is something we're working in this direction. And this is why we want to show as much information on our platform, on our website, to invite scholars to write about it, to make publications, to participate in exhibitions, and uh, to partic uh, participate in conferences like this one. I think that's that's all so far. Do you want to? Because Laurelie, she's part of the Child Stoic International Fund, and we're 10 people, yeah. But we're the only ones to, to here right now. I suggest to go on with the responses. I really don't mm -hmm. want to hurry, but no, no. It's just... <clears throat> uh. 
Okay. I mean, you can continue after. You know, yes, yeah. okay. Um, I I try to be brief as well. Um, Eva, you know that I'm probably the wrong person to ask about. This. I mean, Avi. Um, I'm not. I have nothing to add to Avi's research actually on um, um Romani Jewish victim solidarity. Except for um, if we change the framework a bit and ask for like political activism, uh, there is an interesting aspect um, that uh, the Austrian Jewish community, um, not frequently, but a couple of important times, showed solidarity in the late 2000s, um, early 2010s, when um, Romani migrants have been at the forefront of political debate, like a heavily racialized debate in Austria. It was the Jewish community that um, like, also spoke out uh, on behalf of the Romani migrants. Ah, yeah. Yeah. France. Ah, interesting. Interesting. So, so not only talking about, about um, um, memory activism, but also like in political activism now. And why the Steinmetz example seems to me so important is because like there is this series of um, female actors um, who have been so much at the forefront um, of um, like historical work. It's not only Selma Steinmetz, it's also Erika Durna, and yeah. then we have Chas. So all of those three women like actually um, entered an arena decades before they were followed. Um, and what's also interesting about uh, Selma Steinmetz is that she was, of course, talking on behalf of another victim group, which can be go like which can go terribly wrong. But in her case, it was like it still met standards. Um, uh, it meets standards of uh, of today's work, I would say. And of course, we have horrific examples um, how that could go wrong. I mean, just to quote one, um, like the police of the city of Graz, for instance, installed a memorial plaque uh, to a Romani man um, in front of uh, the very center of persecution where the Gestapo headquarters was, um, reading, here are the, the, so he, here was the place of work um, of this uh, Romani man, who was, of course, a policeman, never worked there. Um, but in that way, they shifted their position from being a clear organization of perpetrators to suddenly as if it was a mixed organization in which people were also persecuted, which is just not a historical fact. So, so the speaking on somebody's behalf can, um, as soon as it becomes hegemonic and not counter-hegemonic, um, it's, it, it's a problem. Um, and just short remarks on the three other topics that I can relate to. So the question of standardization, um, I think a little bit relates to this question of um, perceiving Chaya as an artist or of musealization. Um, and I also think it's quite important uh, to pose this question of whether she actually had the chance to, um, whether she actually had an option in that regard. Because very often she articulated her fear that she, that she would be misread because she was not educated well enough. So I think your argument as, as well as, as you articulated it, the problem with it is um, that it like as soon as somebody is like read against the standards of an educated artist, it's immediately marginalizing her um, given her um, education and history. So I perfectly understand that it's not easy mm -hmm. to solve um, this question. Um, and finally, uh, Miriam to your Chaya Stoika uh, square uh, thing. What I find so fascinating about it that before we are going there is how it's actually still a living memorial despite the city's decision to not choose a square where there are actual addresses. So nobody receives a letter saying Chaya Stoika Square because it's it's like a place with no houses. <laughs> um, but still, like, there are houses, but they have different addresses. But um, as the community uses it every year um, as 
like as a meeting at the, as a gathering place they are like changing it like they are giving meaning to it every year and it's always a different meaning and that's actually what what makes it so so different to a usual like monument memorial in, in my perception so um maybe the, um the, co the two comments the writing being the key to to mm. the pictures yeah, and then the pictures being the key to yeah. the okay i'd like writing. to react um uh, like in two minutes okay. and then <laughs> we have to a a minute you please you. go no. ahead <laughs> uh, please go ahead no no just just uh, i i uh, just in the science of case because I, the other case, I don't know but uh, it's impossible to neglect the writings in Chayasoshka. It's impossible to, to, to neglect the, the simple fact that one drawing has two faces. Uh, one is the picture and the other one is a writing and the writing is important to understand the picture. I'm i be more cautious in the idea of key. To have to think that uh, in art history there's no key that opens doors or I don't know. So I'd be more cautious but with just the vocabulary about the, the, the key thing. I think uh, that from my experience there's a that the problem with the reception in uh, such case work is mainly because people don't pay enough attention to the drawings. They don't look at it precisely. So it's the same problem for historians and art historians. They they, they think they have seen it. And, and no, there is only one methodology in art history is looking, looking and looking again. And if you look at the painting, they give you a lot of keys and uh, that might not require more words. Yeah, and if you look at this notebook sample there where a drawing is made out of texts mm -hmm. and words, for me, it's impossible to separate yeah. the two with her. Mm -hmm. And the more you look at any of these kinds of structures, or like you mentioned, the visual, and you turn it around, there's often writing on the back. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so it's just like this spiral. <laughs> and uh, sorry, one yeah. very important thing is that the writing style is not the same when it's close to the drawings and when it's just writing. The the, the calligraphy. Yeah. It, it's not the same here and here. Uh, it depends. Yeah, it's, it's but it's so vast you find everything. No, but uh, I mean, there is, it's you you find everything. But here there is a regularity that is not here, and here yeah. there is material which is in the ink, which is not the same ink. Yeah. So the material yeah. is affecting as well writing, and it might be very important as well in terms of mm -hmm. transliteration. Mm -hmm. <laughs>